welcome you this morning to the First Congregational Church. We have a few commercial announcements from the family of God before we go too far this morning. First of all, just to inform you, Pastor Phil and his wife Michelle are in New Hampshire at their cabin, enjoying one of these last long weekends of the year. Our prayers are with them for a restful, relaxed time. And I uh, would like to take a moment to welcome Del Ackerley, who is assisting me in worship today. Good morning, Del. And at this time, we'd like to give you an opportunity to sit back, to relax, to be in the spirit of prayer as we listen to our memorial chimes in preparation of worship.
you this morning, please be near to us. We come to you this morning praying to you as you taught us, through the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We humbly sit before you with gratitude for all that you have done in our lives. We come to you with wonder and reverence for all that you will do. But most importantly, we come to you confidently because you have invited us to come. We are confident that the prayers being lifted up to you will be heard and answered. Although sometimes answered in ways that we don't quite understand or expect. <coughs> But we trust in your ways. So Lord, hear our prayers. Generous Lord, we thank you for the many ways that you prove your love for us each day. Sometimes we feel unworthy as we have done things in our lives that you have not approved of. And we have left undone things in our lives that you wanted us to do. Forgive us, Lord. Help us not to let our feelings of guilt of our sin keep us from you, as you are our sole access to forgiveness. Restore us, Lord. Hear our prayers. This morning, hear our prayers for our families. We pray that our homes be havens of peace, justice, love, and protection. Families and homes where our children and all children are nurtured and prepared for life in ways that are spiritually healthy. Placing you first, above and beyond all else. Homes that are reinforced with your son Jesus as the primary support. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord of love, May we never forget you. In time of sorrow and heartbreak, we turn to you knowing that you love us. Comfort us with your healing presence. Especially be with those who have been touched by sudden loss, whose pain and grief causes paralysis. Bless and give strength to those whose loss is unimaginable. Help us to take comfort in your word that teaches us, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Lord, hear our prayers. Healing, Lord, we also pray this morning for those who are ill, for those who are sick physically, those who are in pain emotionally, those who are ailing spiritually, please, Lord, help them and us by sending the healing power of the Holy Spirit upon us. Help us to feel well and whole again. And finally, we pray to the Prince of Peace. We admit to you that sometimes we find the world is moving so fast. We don't always understand all the things that happen to us in our lives. But what we do know, what we do trust, is there is a purpose in all things, and we trust and love you and know that you care for us. Comfort us, as there are things going on in your world today that confuse and frighten us. Help us to understand your ways. Help us to trust you, Lord, as we ask for special prayers this morning. Lord, calm our fears of diseases that threaten our way of life. Bless our men and women who serve us in the military, those who protect and serve our nation. And as you bless those men and women, bless their families the families who keep those home fires burning. As you send your shield of protection upon those men and women, Lord, please protect the innocent in all countries who find themselves in harm's way. 
we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit on all people, of all nations, of all lifestyles, of all faiths and richness and poorness and goodness and evil, so that you may be glorified. Lord, thy kingdom come. Amen. And amen. <laughs>
But our focus this morning will be just half a verse. So let me share with you that the Gospel of Mark content, chapter 9, verse 35b. And sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. The first thing that we notice as we read this brief passage is that a powerful paradox is taking place. It's a paradox in the sense that Jesus' counsel to the disciples runs counter-conventional wisdom and counter-cultural in our society. In our society today, in the disciples' time as well, greatness was measured by how many people served you, not by how many you served. How many catered to your needs? As a matter of fact, in the Jewish culture itself, great time was spent in deciding the relative rank of individuals. This was important in their culture. It was important to know where people fell in the pecking order. How one dealt with a superior was far different than how one dealt with peers. Status, authority, titles were all very important in the protocol of Jewish religious community. But Jesus said something radical to the disciples, something that caught them totally off guard and unprepared as they jockeyed among themselves and boasted about who was greatest of all among them. He said that if someone wants to be first, that person must be servant of all. This was a revolutionary idea to the disciples. It ran counter-cultural to all of their thinking. What a paradox, and it was a powerful paradox for the disciples to wrestle with. And don't we live in a world of paradoxes? Not much has changed. Aren't we challenged daily in our attempts to do those things that feel right, those things that feel just, only to be judged partially? Didn't we all grow up with certain rules that were formed by the society that we lived in, the society that we were raised in, the society we were born into? Weren't we all affected by the culture we lived in, our family of origin? Well, so that you have a better understanding of where I come from, I come from a lower middle class family. I was born of Protestant descent, Episcopalian, baptized in the Episcopal Church, taught from a very young age that we were from the line of Sir Robert the Bruce, the oldest of two sisters. Now, with these facts in mind, there have been many changes in the role of the sexes in the past 50 years, hasn't there? Expectations of men and women have morphed over time. So let's unpack some of the assumptions with some examples, and we'll start by addressing the men in the congregation. Growing up in this culture for me, just south of Boston, most of us were taught at that time what it meant to be a real man. To be a real man meant that you had to be hard, you had to be tough. A real man had a firm handshake. A real man smoked non-filtered cigarettes and drank straight whiskey. A real man had to be tough. He never showed vulnerability. He never showed vulnerability because he would be considered weak. Growing up, I was taught that real men never cried. And if he did, he was considered a sissy. I was informed that a man who is kind was labeled as a pushover, a wimp. We have been taught what it means to be a real man. And at that time, it was to be in charge of your household. 
The man is the breadwinner of the family. Some of us have even been taught that if anyone gives you any lip, any back talk, lack of respect, spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> Isn't that relevant today? One of the many biblical lessons that have been distorted and taken out of context in an attempt to support a warped view of men and discipline. Do you have a better understanding of what I'm talking about concerning social norms? Now, after many years of self-evaluation, personal data deletions, personality rebooting, Re erasing old behavioral tapes and replacing them with new behavioral tapes, creating new ones. A few things I've come to understand about who I am today as a man are these. A real man is a man of character. A real man is a man of honesty. A real man is reliable. A real man strives to be a positive role model. A real man cries. A real man learns the value of being wrapped around the finger of his daughter and doesn't see a softening of the heart as a character defect. A real man is not intimidated or his manhood dissipated if his wife may make more money than he does. A real man does their part around the household. A real man can be soothing and gentle. In addition, it's not what men eat, but what they digest. It's not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. Not what we preach or pray, but what we practice that makes us men and women of God. I've come to learn a real man in the eyes of the world and a real man after God's own heart are two very, very different things. I've had so much to relearn and learn over the years while trying to raise a family. But I've come to learn I was in good company. The disciples in today's gospel lesson from Mark were learning a few important lessons themselves. Now as the father of two daughters, I find it interesting that Jesus puts a child in the midst of the disciples to make an impression. Because for many of us, it's having a child that helped us to clarify our perspective on life. Children can help us to focus on the things that really matter in life. Some of us came back to church and reaffirmed our faith, our relationship with God as a direct result of having a child. Some of us, myself included, held our children for the first time in our arms and knew that there was something much greater at work here than me. <clears throat> for many of us, coming back into the church was an opportunity for us to introduce our children to the God that we knew from our childhood, so that our children could grow up with a foundation of spirituality and religion. Children are wonderful tools for God, as Jesus demonstrates today. Several years ago, you may remember, there was a movie of a 12-year-old boy that has Down's Syndrome, whose self-centered behavior caused his parents great concern. His teacher tried to convince the mother that David, the young boy, could be helped with his self-centeredness if he took part in the Special Olympics, an event for special needs children. David's mother reluctantly agreed. And as it turned out, working with other children toward a common goal did change David. No one knew how much he had changed until the day of the event. David was running toward the finish line, about to win the race. And the crowd was cheering him on. And suddenly, 
Behind him, he noticed a teammate had fallen and stumbled. And David stopped, curiously concerned. He bent down. He hauled that little boy to his feet, wrapped his arm around him, and dragged him forward. And beaming, they both crossed the finish line together. There seems to be something within all of us of a competitive nature. I know that to be true with boys, and boy have I learned that to be true with girls. Always jockeying to be first in line. Everyone wants to be better than the next guy. King of the hill, top of the heap, as Frank Sinatra so wonderfully put it. The secular view of greatness does not include the characteristic of servanthood at all. Prevalent in our society is an attitude that to make it to the top, one must be aggressively challenging, defeating all newcomers. I was taught that it was a, a corporate attitude, a corporate mentality. If anyone gets in the way, they're just a stepping stone. After all, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. The marketplace is sometimes re referred to as the rat race. But the only problem with being in a rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> Drastically different is the picture of biblical greatness. To be great as far as Jesus was concerned was to be a servant. And this servant attitude is central to all authentic ministry. Whether the ministry is a member of the local Rotary Club, or to be great as a servant working for Habitat for Humanity, to be great is to be a servant, to serve overseas, treating children with disorders. To be a servant takes on many shapes and forms within the life of First Congregational Church. If we adopted a worldly view of greatness and success, then in God's eyes, to be truly great, we need to be something other than legends in our own mind. Proper motivation. That's what each of us receives, very simply in the Lord's Prayer. We recite it every single week. An attitude that's essential to true Christian ministry Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In closing, I'm reminded of a, a famous actor who was attending a dinner, and as a dinner speaker at this big function, he was asked to stand up and recite something for the audience, to choose a poem, he asked the audience for him to recite. And there was a long silence until a retired clergyman raised his hand and asked this famous actor to recite the 23rd Psalm. The actor, slightly taken aback, but he agreed to do so, provided the clergyman would recite it after him, which the clergyman reluctantly decided he would do. So the actor recited the 23rd Psalm, and he received a standing ovation. When the clergyman recited the 23rd Psalm, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. The actor came over to the clergyman and said in front of the guests, do you know the difference between his version and my version? The actor said, I know the 23rd Psalm, but the clergyman, he knows the shepherd. I know the shepherd. And as a result, I learned that living my life as God wanted me to was a simple matter. It was a matter of priorities. But this was a lesson not learned the easy way, learned the hard way, as most lessons important in life are learned hard. The disciples needed changing, they needed reordered priorities and reordered lives. Living a godly life is indeed 
a matter of priorities. Amen. And amen. A reminder to each and every one of you that as you leave here today, you don't go alone. But God is with you. God is with you in your laughter and in your tears. God is with you in your victories and in your defeats. But most importantly, God dwells within your heart in the spirit of the risen and living Christ Jesus. Go in peace as we scatter into the world, serving our Lord and Savior until we meet again. Amen. 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 Amen.